six new cases. That's more than twice the previous high uh, daily report. Uh, that brings the state's total number of cases to 9,150. We also have reported 37 additional deaths for a total of 310 statewide. We've got 1,639 COVID positive patients in the hospital across the state, 507 of whom are currently on ventilators. So as I mentioned, I know how startling these numbers are. Um, even though I was prepared for them, you know, they're jarring for me as well. Uh, there is some important context, however, um, for these numbers. 95% of the positive results that we announced today are from tests conducted in commercial labs. The current increase in cases appears to be less a sign of exponential growth um, over the last couple of days and more a sign of a logjam for commercial labs, labs that have developed over a long period of time. And so many of these tests were taken several days, if not longer, ago. It is a very good thing that Louisiana has been able to rapidly ramp up our testing. And in fact, uh, depending on the day, we're somewhere uh, between the third in the nation or fifth in the nation in terms of per capita testing. Uh, that said, uh, the reason we've been able to ramp up is we've got more and more commercial labs that have come online. Um, but our different data systems have to be able to talk to one another, and that is part of the problem. A bigger part of the problem is with private testing, uh, those labs have greatly exceeded their capacity in terms of the tests that they've uh, taken in and that are, they're waiting to actually run through uh, their labs. So what we're seeing is a, is a log jam, and, and these, these tests are coming through in big numbers, uh, breaking through uh, the log jam. You may have seen yesterday Quest by itself reported um, or media reports were that they had 160,000 backlog tests at, at Quest. Uh, similar stories coming out of LabCorp, uh, for example. If there are good news, if there is good news for today's numbers, it's that the vast majority of those people uh, who are COVID positive pursuant to today's report do not require hospitalization. And they've already been told by their physicians that they were COVID positive and they've been in isolation for some time now. While the hospitalization and death rates remain high, uh, it is also true that as we discover all of these new cases, the trend line is here in Louisiana is starting to match up with what we're seeing across the country in terms of the percentage of individuals with COVID-19 who have to be hospitalized and the percentage of those who die. Uh, so so we're, we're moving much closer to the national average. It is true, however, uh, that we still have more than our fair share of people dying, and, and that is likely because we have more than our fair share of people who have the comorbidities uh, that make them especially vulnerable. Uh, again, these are things like diabetes, kidney disease, heart disease, hypertension, um, obesity. But we also have a lot more COVID-19 in Louisiana than we have thought up until now. And that's what the last three days of, of test results has, I think, unequivocally showed. Uh, you've heard a lot of talk about modeling, and I had a question about this yesterday, and I wanted to come out and address it. We're still working on our model as it relates to the number of deaths that we believe we can expect uh, from COVID-19. But I was asked yesterday about uh, the national modeling that was used um, at the press conference at the White House two nights ago, you might remember it showed that nationwide we, we could expect between 100,000 and 240,000 deaths. Um, that model uh, suggests that uh, in Louisiana, uh, the total deaths would be about 800, I'm sorry, 1,834. Um, I would assume but I'm not certain that that's sort of the midline between those two ranges um, because, you know, nationally it was between 100,000 and 240,000. So th there has to be a range for Louisiana as well, and we hope to be able to update you more on this uh, shortly. Uh, but I would like to remind everyone, and I say remind maybe the wrong word, 
uh, that model was used two nights ago from the White House to talk about the number of deaths we could uh, expect. But they didn't say that one of the assumptions underlying that model is that we actually continue uh, to uh, have the same mitigation measures in place all the way through the month of May. Uh, and so any of these numbers would, would also uh, have to um, be attached to that particular assumption. Now, those, that model, the national model also says that we will reach our peak count of daily deaths in about eight days. Uh, with the death rate being about 76, starting on April the 10th. Obviously, this is very imprecise, and, and I'm not sure that that's, that that's what we're going to actually see or, or that the peak may be higher than that and it may come later than that. Uh, but what we know is we all have a role to play, and we can determine collectively by our individual actions um, how much worse this virus will impact our families, our communities, our parishes, and our state. That's related to how many cases we have in the state, how many people have to be hospitalized, how many people have to die, uh, the demands we put on our health care system. Uh, I would uh, underscore that this virus is in all of the parishes across the state of Louisiana. Um, I think we actually added one more parish uh, today, uh, and that was Caldwell Parish? Caldwell Parish. Um, there are still three parishes up here with a zero. Uh, I promise you there is the novel coronavirus and there's COVID-19 in every one of those parishes and in every community across the state of Louisiana. So this remains an extremely serious public health emergency and I am asking for the vigilance of all Louisianas, Louisianas because that is key to flattening the curve and slowing the spread. That's also why later today I'm going to sign an executive order extending the stay-at-home mitigation measures through April the 30th. I told you several days ago that I would do this. Um, and this order will be in alignment with the guidance coming from the federal government uh, two nights ago uh, when President Trump announced the, the mitigation measures that, that he thought we should have in place through April the 30th. The new order is largely the same as the old one, except that it just now goes through the end of the month. Um, and I am going to go back over the list of businesses that remain closed to the public, all places of public amusement, whether indoors or outdoors, including but not limited to locations with amusement rides, carnivals, amusement parks, water parks, water parks, trampoline parks, aquariums, zoos, museums, arcades, fairs, pool halls, children play centers, playgrounds, theme parks, any theaters, concert, music halls, adult entertainment venues, racetracks, and other similar businesses. All personal care and grooming businesses, including but not limited to barbershops, beauty salons, nail salons, spas, massage parlors, tattoo parlors, and other similar businesses. All malls, except for stores in a mall that have a direct outdoor entrance and exit that provide essential services and products as provided by the CISA guidelines. Businesses closed to the public pursuant to this provision shall not be prohibited from conducting necessary activities such as payroll, cleaning services, maintenance, or upkeep as necessary, but they are closed to the public. Uh, the order means that you still cannot gather in groups of more than 10, uh, but frankly, you shouldn't be gathering in groups at all. That's what we've been talking about, minimizing social contact. And certainly, if you're one of the more vulnerable people in our population by age or underlying health condition, you absolutely should not be uh, gathering in groups. And it would be a great thing if Louisianans could employ their ingenuity uh, to find new and different ways to connect uh, with individuals without having to be physically uh, together. Guidelines for funeral services and licensure for health care workers uh, were already extended through, uh, through April the 30th in the previous order, so those will not change. School closures will continue through April the 30th, uh, and I can tell you that the Department of Education is in the process of determining uh, what will happen beyond April the 30th, and I suspect we're going to have uh, some guidance from them uh, very soon, either tomorrow or early next week. Tomorrow, uh, today, we're also announcing a new way that the public can stay up to date on the latest information concerning this crisis. 
This afternoon at 4 p.m., we're sending an emergency alert to all cell phones in Louisiana to alert them of the stay-at-home order. I know that people are used to associating this alert with severe weather, um, which is why I wanted to give everybody a heads up that it is going to come today. That said, it underscores how seriously we take uh, this public health emergency in Louisiana. As you can see from our report today, it truly is a life or death situation. If people want to get alerts and updates, uh, they should um, they can opt in uh, for text by texting LACOVID LA COVID to six seven two eight three. A lot of people are watching these news conferences, and I appreciate our media partners who bring these resources to you every day. Um, and I want to let you know that we've added new information to the Department of Health dashboard in an attempt to be extremely transparent uh, and uh, candid with the people of Louisiana and do it in a real-time basis. So you're not going to be able to see information about available beds, ICU beds, and ventilators by region of the state. It will be updated daily at noon, just as all of the other information is updated related to testing. For more information and available resources, you can also visit the website coronavirus.la.gov, coronavirus.la.gov. That is a new address. Um, we are working to unite as much information as possible because we are in this for the long haul, and we want this information to be readily available. I also want to thank really so many people across the state who work extremely hard every day, and we've been talking about doctors and nurses and respiratory therapists and all the other allied healthcare professionals, and they are true heroes in this. And we've got first responders um, all across the state uh, at the local level and so forth doing tremendous work. Uh, and at the state level, we, we've got a lot of people working extremely hard and extremely well. I do want to shout, give a shout out to the National Guard today. Uh, they have been delivering supplies throughout the state uh, for the entire time that we've been in this emergency. We currently have over 1,210 soldiers and airmen assisting with the COVID-19 response from the Louisiana National Guard. In addition to their numerous other missions, they've been able to deliver 366,555 N95 masks, over 1 million gloves, 450 ventilators, and 49,650 Tyvek suits, just to name a few of the items that they have been delivering. I also want to thank ExxonMobil, Baton Rouge, for partnering with the Global Center for Medical Innovation to develop new industrial-style masks and put on the fast track for production for doctors and nurses and other health care providers. Uh, these masks can be sterilized and worn multiple times. Uh, once approved by the FDA, they will be able to produce as many as 40,000 ready-to-use masks and filter cartridges per hour. Our ExxonMobil Baton Rouge chemical plant is proudly supplying the polypropylene that's used to manufacture this project. In closing today, and before I take the questions that you might have for me, I did want to point out that among the deaths that we have announced, uh, Louisiana lost a legend yesterday with the death of Ellis Marsalis, um, and his family is attributing his death to COVID-19. Uh, he was the proud patriarch of one of the most prominent jazz families in New Orleans, serving as the director of the jazz department at NOCA, and also he worked at the University of New Orleans. He was a mentor to countless jazz greats and has left an indelible mark on the soul of New Orleans. Um, and really the country and beyond. Of course, some of his best students include his sons, Brantford, Wenton, Delfeo, and Jason, whose music we all enjoy. So this should be a sad reminder for all of us of the terrible toll that this disease, COVID-19, has taken on our people. So please join me in lifting up the Marsalis family and really all families of the deceased uh, in your prayers. Uh, as I normally do, I've got Dr. Alex, be you here to take uh, specific questions that might relate to testing? And with that, I'll be happy to take your questions. Yes, sir. Governor, given the sort of easiness you've described in the new 
new cases that are confirmed in the past few days, this log jam, and there's uh, older test results. Uh, what, how, how exactly are you leading the state's response to this and like uh, grappling with the numbers? Do you have better data when it comes to the, the specific dates these tests are conducted? Or are you looking at something else, uh, some other component of the data uh, that's uh, informing the response? Well, um, I, I will tell you what I've been told, and I want Dr. B to, to pay attention as he always does. And if I say something wrong, come, come and correct me. Um, Obviously, the number of cases we report on a daily basis is important. It's important to know that. Um, but the two data points that inform our modeling more than any other, and really inform the modeling, I think, everywhere, are not new cases. They happen to be hospitalizations and deaths. And the, the reason is uh, new cases is, gives you a, a picture of how much COVID is, is out there but the fact of the matter is some significant percentage of people have COVID, they're totally asymptomatic. They, they've never been tested and they're not going to be tested anytime in the near future. And if you read different studies, one came out of Iceland that suggests that number could be as high as 50%. And so the, the number of new cases doesn't necessarily tell you the trajectory you're on in terms of what you can expect to happen at your hospitals uh, and in your ICU beds and on ventilators. So if you look at the number of people you have in your hospitals uh, and, and the number of deaths, those two data points actually can tell you what trajectory that you're on. And so that's, that's what's informing our modeling. Um, and, and quite frankly, um, uh, it suggests that we are still uh, headed to a place where we're going to overwhelm our capacity to deliver health care as, as it relates to uh, the total beds available uh, and to ventilators. Um, and even though we're reporting the highest number of cases today, the modeling that we have shows that those dates have slipped back in time, not ahead. Uh, I think it's one more day than what we reported yesterday. Uh, and so, so, you know, and I didn't write this down and I'll have to confirm this. I think it's April the 7th for vents and the 12th for beds. Uh, in the New Orleans region. And our modeling doesn't show, and, and the further out you try to model, the, the more error there's going to be and the less you really can, can glean from your modeling efforts. We don't have in the 14-day window of our current modeling any other regions running out of, of uh, beds. Uh, and so, so we, we will continue to update this modeling with new information as it comes in every single day. Yes, sir. This may be somewhat of a follow-up to that, but obviously Tuesday we saw a big spike in cases, Wednesday, and then today, um, and this may be a question partially for Dr. Biu, um, how long can we expect maybe thousands of cases at a time as it relates to maybe how big is this backlog, this logjam yeah. of, of cases? Well, you know, we don't have really good information until we get it. Uh, we can tell you anecdotally, for example, that the drive-through testing that was conducted has been conducted in New Orleans uh, at two sites that have since been combined into one, but they're testing up to 500 a day there, uh, and 250 drive-throughs at um, in Jefferson Parish. The majority of all of those tests have not yet been reported, so at some point they're going to come through. And whether they come through in a uniform amount every day or whether there's there's an exceptionally large number of, of results that come through in a single day, we don't really know. And so until we come out here and tell you what that day's report is, we don't really know what to expect. Um, but we think that that's going to continue to happen. The good news is the vast majority of those tests are being done on a drive through basis. So those people are not so sick that they have to be in the hospital in the first instance. And so it's much more likely that those individuals don't have to go to the hospital in order to deal with this particular disease. And we're telling people when they show up to be tested, you may or may not be COVID positive, and if you, we're going to tell you the result as soon as we have it. But from this point forward, you are to act as if you are. Um, and so go home, uh, quarantine yourself, uh, and, and uh, we will let you know what the results are. So those people should be, until they, they're deemed by their health care providers to be recovered, at home in isolation. 
Uh, so that's, that's the good news uh, with the vast majority of those particular individuals. And I wish I could give you a better answer, but the truth is we, we know more every day, but we don't know it before we report it. Yes, sir. Governor, any update on the uh, two state lawmakers that are battling the uh, COVID-19? Um, I don't have an update, um, and I haven't been authorized by them or their families to share any information about their identities or their situations in, in any case. So I just, I just don't want to do it. Um, like everybody who is struggling with COVID-19 right now, though, I would ask everybody to lift uh, these individuals up um, in, in prayer. Yes. Um, have you made any progress in getting additional ventilators at this point? And, and what is going on with the pricing that you're seeing? Is it, and, and has it reached a level of reporting it for gouging? We've already reported uh, some to the U.S. attorneys for the Middle District uh, with respect to potential price gouging. Uh, we have distributed 450 ventilators uh, since the start of this, uh, and that included yesterday the 150 that came from the Strategic National Stockpile. We have not gotten a line on any additional ventilators. We do believe that that some of the orders we have with vendors, for example, uh, will come in, certainly not all of them, and we continue to call those people daily uh, to check on that. Uh, we, are, we are trying to source ventilators literally all over the world, um, and, and the price has at least doubled on every ventilator that we're looking at uh, from uh, just where they were three to four weeks ago. So it's a very expensive thing but but you know we, we have to do our our best to get what we need to take care of as many people as possible so so that uh, uh, if and when we exceed our capacity it's by the smallest number of people possible that's that's what we do in order to protect the the health and welfare of the people of Louisiana and we are being aggressive we are also renewing requests for those uh, ventilators that have been held uh, at the strategic national stockpile so while we got 150 we we know that some additional uh, ventilators were held there for a subsequent allocation and distribution and we're making our case for our share of those and i don't have any update uh, on that as we speak on that point though i, I know that there's been guidance put out i think maybe by fema about what um, a checklist that yeah. states have to provide are you finding it um a, a checklist that is easy to comply with, yeah. or are, are the hurdles great? I'm not going to say it's easy to comply with, but we complied with it, and we sent in a, an updated request last night with every data point that they were requesting, uh, and, in, and including um, uh, additional information that we thought would, would aid us in getting uh, the attention of the decision makers as it relates to, to those ventilators. So we did it last night. Uh, we continue to pursue... Um, uh, those ventilators and every other ventilator that that we can that we can find uh, because it is incredibly important yes sir um a few day, nights ago on the program you were also in dr Fauci spoke was asked about the possibility of further guidelines maybe requiring yeah. people in public to wear masks or face covering yeah. of some kind i know a few states have already started um looking into that or implementing that as from your standpoint is that something possibly possibly down the line you could be looking at or is that you wait for the feds well well sure it's something we can look at what, what we don't want to do in the meantime is take the types of masks that are being worn by our health care providers uh, before they have enough um, but there is some evidence and I think it's growing and I think I think there's a growing consensus um, uh, around this that that the disease can spread uh, perhaps more easily than they thought by people breathing and, 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 and so forth. Uh, and so some covering of the mouth would, would aid that. Um, I, the, the person wearing the mask is, I think, protecting others more than they're protecting themselves. But if we all do it, then there's protection for everyone. So that, that may come, um, but, but I will tell you, in order to, to uh, offer that protection, it is not necessary for the individual to wear an N95 mask that are in short supply for our healthcare providers. Um, but there may be some other things that, that could be worn. Um, and and I, I don't believe that I would ever issue an order that says to go out in public, you have to wear a mask. 
Um, but no, nor would I issue something that says you cannot. And so individuals are free to do this right now. And, and we're waiting because, you know, the, the Surgeon General, Dr. Fauci, people at the CDC and, and, and so forth, until very recently, they had a different opinion. And I don't know that they've come all the way in favor of, of uh, wearing masks, but it appears that they might be headed there. Uh, so individuals are free to do that uh, now. It, it, you know, and, and again, I don't think they have to have the N95 mask, um, but, but there are other things that they can wear. Yes, sir. Governor, I know the Department of Education released a little bit about the steps next for, uh, for uh, in regards to this crisis. You said that the schools will remain closed until April 30th as yeah. well. What kind of impact is this going to have on high school graduating seniors and just high schoolers who are going to the next grade level kind of in the long term, you think? Yeah, well, you know, I think there are going to be some options that, that are, uh, I know that there are options being discussed now. Uh, with Betsy Ano, who is the um, interim superintendent uh, of education for Louisiana, and all the, the district superintendents. Uh, and they're really going to come out with an announcement soon, and I, I don't, really don't want to get in front of them. Um, but I don't believe you're going to see uh, folks retained uh, in, in grades uh, unnecessarily. Uh, there, there are options out there. As you can imagine, they can take the grades as they existed on March the 13th, and that can be the final grade uh, for the semester. Uh, they can convert to pass-fail, uh, and if they do that, uh, if that's the option, we will make sure that that doesn't interfere with someone's ability to qualify for TOPS, for example. Um, now, graduation ceremonies are something different. I don't know when we're going to be in a position to have a ceremony. Uh, but I don't think you're going to see uh, a, a radically different percentage of high school seniors graduate this year as opposed to previous years. And that, that just doesn't make sense for anybody, uh, not just the, the seniors, but, but for the state of Louisiana. But they're, they're working through this now, and they're going to have more specific information very soon. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off uh, discussing this anymore until they, they do that. Melinda? Uh, this may be for Dr. Bu, but I know we've discussed before the idea of reporting recoveries, and some countries have started reporting recoveries. Are we any closer to getting to the point where Louisiana can start reporting how many people have recovered from? Let me report one, Sean Wilson. <laughs> and and, and I, first of all, he's my Secretary of Transportation um, and a very valuable member of our team, and I'm I'm very happy uh, that he is recovered and, and back at work. Um, there are obviously more people than Sean Wilson who, who have recovered, and I am going to ask Dr. Uh, BU to address this. But of all the data points that we have out there, the least consequential to us right now are those recovered because that doesn't change anything about the decisions we have to make. And so we don't want to spend a lot of time, effort, and energy trying to ascertain that information if it takes us off the task at hand which is getting all the other data points uh, that are critically important. So, yeah, I, I, as always, agree exactly with what the, the governor just said. You know, I, I think we're still looking at, at platforms that would help us do that electronically. We're, we're still even considering the idea of using volunteers. I think one of the things to highlight what, what the governor said earlier, though, is, you know, there's obviously a lot of public interest around COVID-19. We still have to keep in mind that individuals still are, are you know, have the right to their privacy about their health information. So we're really thinking about thoughtfully, how do we gather that information in a way uh, that, that also, um, uh, you know, uh, looks at their privacy and, and, and honors that. Um, but as the governor said, the most important thing is what we're keeping our eyes on right now with really looking at healthcare resources and, and trying to find out the, the people who need to um, uh, be taken care of in a hospital. Yes, sir. Governor, I think the CDC indicated uh, they were going to issue new guidance to states about high, low, and medium risk counties and that sort of thing. Have we gotten any update on that? And also, do you have an update on where the next um, sir step down facility is going to be located? What region of the state is Baton Rouge or somewhere else? Okay. I don't believe we've received that information. And, and I saw that a couple of nights ago. And look, we, we scour it. And by the way, the CDC, the federal government, has been pretty good. They don't just put something out and you got to go get it. Every time they put something out, they send it to me. They send it to the uh, Department of Health. Our communications people get it. I haven't seen that yet, uh, so I, I do expect that it's forthcoming. 
um, and it may or may not have information that, that causes us to, to do something differently than we're currently doing. Uh, and then your second question, I'm sorry. This uh, next step down facility, what region oh. of the state is gonna be in? What, how time yeah. on that? Well, as I mentioned a, a minute ago, the modeling that we have right now um, for the period of time that, that it's reliable doesn't tell us the next region that will uh, exceed its capacity for beds or ventilators. Um, that's gonna change over the next couple of days. What we're doing in the meantime, and, and when it changes, we're gonna make the decision about which area, and it could be more than one, uh, that, that we pull the trigger on all at once. In the meantime, we are surveying uh, and studying multiple facilities in every region of the state to see what the suitability is and, and what the cost would be to go in and stand it up uh, as a step-down uh, medical monitoring hospital, similar to what we're doing at the Convention Center in New Orleans. And we're gathering all that data uh, and and so we're we're well ahead in the process, but we haven't had to reach the trigger points, and we haven't yet. Uh, but I can imagine that before this is over, we're going to have uh, these facilities in all of the the really populated areas. So obviously here in Baton Rouge, but obviously over in Lafayette and, and, and Lake Charles as well. Uh, potentially Central Louisiana and, and Rapides Parish, and then you get up to. Um, uh, the Shreveport area and over to, to Monroe as well. Uh, we won't have one in every region of the state as those regions are defined by LDH. I, there are nine of those. We won't have nine of these facilities, and so there will be some regions that will be uh, surging those patients into the facilities set up in a nearby region. It just the, the, the logistics. Uh, of trying to operate that many becomes really difficult and the the opportunity to find staffing to operate that many facilities becomes very difficult as well leo last question you get the last one well, uh, thank you. Uh, you just mentioned another litany of businesses that are open to the public is there any mechanism that uh, you would have to enforce that to make sure the public didn't show up well it's First of all, the, the order is valid as a matter of law. Um, I cannot tell you what percentage of these businesses are complying, although it's a very, very high uh, percentage that, that are complying and are remaining closed. And where we have law enforcement that sees one of these businesses open, they are absolutely um, empowered to go in and, and tell, remind the individual, point out the order. Uh, that they close and and if they choose not to do so then there are lots of remedies available including um, Charges, but also the the loss of their uh, Occupational license and that that sort of thing. So we From the very beginning obviously we we can and will enforce uh, the order to the extent that we need to but if Louisianans uh, Are going to insist that we enforce our way through this then we're going to have a very, very hard time flattening the curve. We have 4.7 million people in Louisiana. We have tens of thousands of businesses. We have 4,500 or so churches. Uh, and so I'm counting on the goodness, the decency uh, of the people of Louisiana uh, to, to cooperate. The imperative that we've been talking about since the very first day uh, for the people of Louisiana is to uh, embrace these mitigation measures, the stay-at-home order, the social distancing. Uh, because if we don't, if we don't greatly limit social contact, uh, we, are, we are then not going to, to flatten that curve to the degree that we could. And then when we exceed the cap capacity of our health care facilities, it will be by an amount that's larger than it needed to be. And that will directly correlate to the number of people who will die. And so I'm again urging everybody in the state of Louisiana, comply. And understand this is not a problem just for New Orleans and Jefferson Parish or Shreveport or Baton Rouge. This is all throughout the state. And the guidance coming out of the White House today is in those rural areas where you don't have a large case count, don't breathe easy. The time is now to take action to make sure you don't get the cases because you're always further behind this virus than you think you are you are always further behind and so if you wait until the numbers grab your attention 
guess what? You just let the virus win. And we have been behind this thing uh, in the United States and the state of Louisiana from the beginning. Uh, and, and so we, we have to, to do better on, on our compliance. And by the way, I, I still want to thank those people who are complying. And you have different ways to, to kind of measure compliance on, on social distancing. And I know that uh, people's cell phones have the GPS devices and you've got these studies that are being done. Uh, New Orleans actually has a very high level of compliance right now. So does Baton Rouge and Bossier. Uh, there, are some, there are some areas that are doing extremely well. There are other areas of our state that are not doing well at all. Uh, and that's why we continue to make the point, this virus, this disease is throughout the state of Louisiana. And everybody needs to take it seriously. And everybody is going to take it seriously at some point. It's going to be when there is a death uh, that is close to them. Well, wouldn't it be better if we took it seriously so that that never has to happen? I think the answer speaks for itself. So I would encourage people to comply. And uh, we will have another briefing. I'll let you all know when that's going to be. I suspect it will be tomorrow uh, at about the same time. Uh, in, in between now and then, I ask everybody to do what they can to comply. Uh, show gratitude to our uh, first responders and healthcare professionals, and then let's lift each one another, uh, each other up in prayer. Thank you all so much.